you've developed this pro or process has kind of led you to this three-legged stool sure. um, theory right now. How, how does that, how, can, can you just talk about that, explain that? Sure. All of us that have been on Wall Street for a long time, we're, we've all heard in 1997 to 2000 when we had the excessive euphoria, textbook excessive euphoria about the profit potential of internet stocks. And we all heard it on the phone or over lunch, you can't lose money in the stock market. Mm -hmm. and especially in the new paradigm of internet stocks. Well, you were at Morgan Stanley in 1999, and you were at the epicenter of that. Yes. I was at First Boston. I mean, it was incredible that that was just such a given back then. It, it, it was, yeah. and then people really believed it. And, and it's, the, it's different this time. It was mm -hmm. absolutely prevalent, and that, that's textbook bubble, mm -hmm. textbook bubble. So fast forward to 2004, 2005, 2006, when we talked to people, well, you know, Chris, I'm... I'm a little concerned about my stocks, but my real estate, you know, my house and those four <laughs> investment properties that I have, you, j you can't lose money yeah. on real estate. And of course, after two 50% plus declines in the stock market and the bursting of the housing bubble and understanding that collateralized mortgage obligations really don't diversify risk really in any meaningful way, those two legs of the stool have been cut out. They're gone. Mm -hmm. The third leg of the stool is the belief that central bankers, mainly the Fed, can always bail out the financial system. And if you think of excessive pessimism or excessive optimism that we had at the other two peaks, mm -hmm. stocks can't go down, real estate can't go down, we don't have anything like that today. If anything, we have lingering doubt about investing in general, mm -hmm. and for good reason. People have seen these wild swings they do still believe, for the most part, especially it's prevalent on Twitter, mm -hmm. that you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, all those charts you have, throw them in the trash can. The only mm -hmm. thing that matters is the Fed. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that saves you a lot of work to, to just come to that conclusion. I exactly. Mean, I, I, if, I, if I've seen that tweet, Chris, a hundred times, I've seen it a hundred thousand times, which is really useful. I mean, I wouldn't have to get up in the morning if that's all I did. No. And, and that's actually at the point that we're at. I mean, today is a good example. The economic data was putrid. Uh, both the housing data on the MBA mortgage purchase app side, I mean, it was, it's down like 71% year over year with rates falling. GDP was just a disaster. And, and all of a sudden, the market bounces. And you're sitting there, I don't know about you, but I'm sitting there thinking, what is Janet Yellen going to say this time? Because she's going to sp speak now intraday. That's, you, what, that's how people deal with it, isn't it? We were thinking the exact same way this morning, that <laughs> bad news could be good news. Right. And the odds You of don't know why, it's just because the reaction is why, and you'd agree with that. Right. We, we know the odds are extremely high that the reaction will be to try to talk up equities. And right. what we don't know is how the market will react to that. So trying to forecast a monthly labor report, worrying about it that much, really mm -hmm. what you really should worry about is how does the market react to right. that report. And, and if we look at the market's pricing mechanism, what you can also do is th there's no magical risk on risk off ratio. There's no magical indicator. However, there are a lot of things that can help us from a probabilistic perspective. So the way we look at the markets, what we do is we basically diversify. Mm -hmm. So we say we're going to look at multiple inputs. We know they're not all going to be wrong at the same time. We're going to do it on multiple time frames. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what you're doing is from a probability perspective, when things change, it either checks bullish boxes mm -hmm. or bearish boxes. And it's all observable, unbiased numerical, you can literally get it down to zeros and ones, mm -hmm. yes or no. Mm -hmm. it, is price above this moving average, yes mm -hmm. or no. Is the slope up or down, yes or no. And that's, where, that's the weather forecasting part. And if you do it that way and pay attention to the knowns that you have in front of you and adjust on the fly with a flexible attitude that mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen next, you hit the biggest part of investing, which is don't make big mistakes. Yeah. You will be wrong. We know we're going to be wrong. We just don't want to be wrong for three years. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to miss a three-year run. No, trying to validate your forecast. I mean, you see this. You see this uh, people have been undressed on Twitter, and I'm not going to name names, but people have been making a bearish call in the stock market for a year and a half. I mean, it's just constantly, constantly storytelling. But the reality is that the, going back to the three-legged stool risk, the three-legged stool, one day you wake up, and all of a sudden, the behavioral factor that is people believing that the Fed is never going to let interest rates go up for the wrong way. Correct. For inflation. 
you know, again, I'd say that you know, of the three big kind of legs that you laid out, tech bubble, housing bubble, and Fed bubble, one of the big ones is actually the bond market is not allowed to go down. And in fact, when it did go down, you know, and Bill Gross hit the roof to high heaven, he was going to make sure that that didn't happen again. <laughs> this was not supposed to happen. You know, but again, when this happens, when all of a sudden inflation starts to uh, become a real issue and the Fed starts to have to address this, that's one, I, I'd say that that's one way where you could wake up and all of a sudden the whole construct of how people have thought about this starts to change. It can work both ways. You, you can get the 1994 situation like right. that. Where it, it can happen two ways. Well, 1994, 95, they're chasing it for growth because growth was hot and Greenspan had to catch up 250 basis point hikes in a row. Correct. But the, the wrong way is when the bond vigilantes start to go after you from an inflation perspective. Correct. Two ways it can happen, really. Interest rates spike. No matter, yeah. doesn't matter how, why they spike. Yeah, this is your whole premise. It the, doesn't the, matter why. It's what they're doing. They spike. And the other one is that, that I don't think we think about a lot. What about the other end of the fact spectrum? What happens if deflation rules the day yeah. and, and we get to a point where investors <clears throat> Say, hey, I just, I just saw two devastating bear markets. Mm -hmm. And let's say the economy starts to roll over. So we're speaking hypotheticals. Let's say the economy rolls over here and we go into a corrective process. And the perception becomes the Fed shot most of their bullets already. Yeah, that's a great You point. know, the, the, they've done massive QE. Right. They've held interest rates at unbelievably low levels, which is an, a, a whole other point. How strong is the economy that we have today when we can't gain traction, when we've been printing money like psychos and had interest rates at almost zero? So at a point you just wake up, there will be a day of reckoning where you just wake up and the Fed is out of bullets. GDP, if GDP tracks anywhere, our view is that if GDP tracks anywhere with a one handle, past this you know, ridiculous comment about the weather. The weather. Right. The weather's going to be haunting the bulls you know, well into you know, next winter, I right. guess. But the, the point is that if growth surprises on the downside, people are going to finally say, hey, look, the Fed actually can't go to QE6. And if they do, isn't that going to make the market freak out? Like, I, I'm, I'm having and a There's your third leg of the stool, yeah. where if that gives way, where the perception becomes what you just said, that they're out of bullets and the economy is not responding, what do we think they'll do? We know they'll try something. They absolutely, absolutely. will. There's just so many reasons for it. No one wants a crisis on mm -hmm. their watch. No one can get reelected when, when the economy is doing poorly. So they're going to try to do something. It's when we hit that point where the economy is weakening and they try to fire a bullet and nothing, nothing happens. happens. Well, this is what happened. You know, this was one of the easiest calls to make. If you take our approach is similar in that we take what the market gives us, we go with the reaction. Yep. We don't go with the predetermined policy outcome that these you know, almighty central planners lay on the table. This is specifically what happened with the bazooka. So Hank Paulson got into the room with the Ben Bernanke, and the Ben Bernanke and the Hank Paulson, I think we called him the Hank the Market Tank at that point, because he shot the bazooka and the market didn't react. Right. And that point was one of the most obvious points where even if you weren't blowing up the whole way down into October, from the Q1 to October, if you bought them there, you blew yourself right six ways to Sunday. Absolutely. By going on the wrong behavioral assumption that the policymaker is absolutely in control of the plane. And, and, and we talked about it just a few minutes ago. Um, we saw a little glimpse of it in 2011. Right. We did. And there was a the stock market did. There was a misconception yeah. in 2011 that it was all about the U.S. debt problems. That's right. what we were focused. It was really Europe is what, what Because we the media at that point was such, U or still is today, it's so U.S.-centric navel-gazing. You know, so we were really, people were really landlocked on the former war. That's how people think about the risk in, in media. They go back to the prior risk, which is not going to be the current risk. A absolutely. And, and what the market was really focusing on was systemic risk, banking risk in Europe. And how do we know that? Well, yeah. the Fed tried to talk up the markets a few times in the second half. Yeah, a few times more than a couple times. Yeah, and, and we didn't get anything. And boy, I'll tell you, that, that was kind of scary when they came out and tried to talk it up. So eventually what happened was, the ECB came out with the unlimited three-year loans. And, and, the, and yep. how do we know that that's what the market cared about? Because once they did that, the market went straight up. Right, exactly. Basically. So we've seen little glimpses of it. And if that third leg of the stool gives way, think of it from a psychological perspective. Clients have seen two devastating bear markets. At some point, they're going to say, look, I've seen this script before. Yeah. I, I'm not going to stand here They'll and get They'll be qu quick to get up. Yeah. yeah. The, the, 
we're all going to be running for a little thin door. A lot of people are going to be pushing the sell button potentially. That's the bad news. The good news is if you have a way to monitor the risk and keep an eye on all this stuff, things like this don't happen like this. You don't get trends like this and then it, you, you don't get rooftops. No. It's a, it's a process and it, it's a titanic turning around and why that's important if you're paying attention. The flash crash didn't come out of nowhere. 1987 didn't come out of nowhere. The market peaked in August mm -hmm. and, and it crashed in 87. So my point is you'll have some warning if you're paying attention. You'll have already gone and got a windbreaker or a hat or something because the weather conditions mm -hmm. are changing a little bit. And why that's important is when you get to those flash crash type events or 1987 type events, if, if you're looking at numbers, zeros and ones, risk on, risk off, those numbers are very, very vulnerable here, and they let you run away at a very, very yeah. fast rate. And what ends it doesn't up, mean you get out of the uh, way in advance. What ends up happening, actually, on all these turns, and you know, we would say the tops are processes, not points. And I think Chris just articulated that quite well, just said a different way. It's the same thought process. You get many opportunities to leave what Buddy Carter called the ZERP party. You get, you know, you're either at the door and you're going to take, you know, take the check and leave, or you're going to sit there and double down and have another shot. And what ends up happening when you get these signals, and again, we use you know, kind of thermodynamic speak in this regard, you're approaching the waterfall. At the point of entropy, it's over. Yeah. But you can see the water is picking up, and the depth and, and, and the velocity of the water is not well understood. But once we get there, you have many opportunities to get out. And what happens is people start to buy, you know, to double down and triple down. And those are the first sellers. That's what creates the first you know, kind of swoosh.